Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Mandy, and I represent um, a company called I2 Art Insure. We're specialist art insurance, insurers, um, not only art, all collectibles, uh, which require a very specific kind of, of uh, insurance. And we are delighted for the first time to be involved with the Cape Town Art Fair as the sponsor of the talks program. Um, if you look at that poster over there, you can actually win yourself uh, a special bot bottle of gin. You just scan the QR code. And you can also organize instant insurance for any artwork that you may purchase here at the fair. More importantly, please don't leave without the, a little black bag. It has a very special card in it, which if you keep it between your own credit cards, it protects them from incidental fraudulent scanning. So it's not just a little business card to throw away. Make sure you get one. It's a very, very special <laughs> gift. Thank you very much. Uh, we're looking forward to the panel discussion and enjoy the rest of the art fair weekend. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Nontlantla. I'm from the Cape Town Art Fair team, and we're very happy to have you guys here today. And also, we would like to welcome um, Elizabeth from the Wildenstein Platner. Um, institution, institution in New York. She's the one who's responsible for actually bringing these panelists together and sponsoring this part of the talks. So I'd like us to welcome the panel and Elizabeth will take over from here. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Nankwanka. Thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Garev. I'm the executive director of the Wildenstein Plattner Institute, which is a nonprofit private foundation based in New York with a sister office in Paris. We were founded by Guy Wildenstein and the Wildenstein family and the Hasso Plattner Foundation. Hasso Plattner actually has a design school here in Cape Town, um, which is why I was very intrigued to come to Cape Town. Um, what we do at the WPI is we ensure that artists' legacies, artists' archives, artists' catalogs, raisonné, are produced and published and accessible to the art world for free. Um, so if you check out our website, you can see the various publications that we've put online. Did a little bit of feedback. Um, should I? Okay. Maybe I'll just speak less forcefully. <laughs> that will help. Uh, check out our website. Check out our Instagram, wpi.art. Um, before I introduce my esteemed panelists today, I would just like to talk a little bit about why we are gathered here to talk about artists' legacies and artists' archives. And I'm going to give you three case studies um, that are specific to my foundation. Um, you're looking at a picture of the studio, the working studio and home of Claude Monet, the French, great French Impressionist artist. And this picture was taken in the 1920s, um, before he died in 1926. And when he died, unfortunately, um, there was no accounting for his, ooh, did I just turn it off? How do I advance? Maybe you could advance one slide for me. Green button. Ah, this one. Thank you. Okay. I've got it now. Uh, when he died, there was no accounting of his work, and one very pioneering art Daniel, dealer, Daniel Wildenstein, just saw an opportunity, and he took it. And what he did was he spent uh, four decades seeking out all of the works by Monet and compiling them for a catalog raisonné that listed every single picture, its whereabouts, its exhibition history, and its select bibliography. Now, this was a great service for the art world, but it was also very financially profitable for Daniel Wildenstein, who became the foremost art dealer on the works of Claude Monet. Um, catalog raisonnés, for those who, of you who aren't familiar with them, are compendiums of the works that artists produce. 
They're very costly to produce, very time consuming. And um, oftentimes uh, they're produced posthumously. And those who are incentivized to produce them are usually the um, members of the art market who have uh, uh, reason um, to go forth and perhaps capitalize on that type of production. Another catalog raisonné project that um, the WPI was specifically involved with was the catalog raisonné for the artist Jasper Johns. So um, Johns, you're looking at a picture of him on the left with, I believe that's his early dealer, Leo Castelli. Johns was embraced by the art world very early on in his career and benefited certainly from um, the architecture that was established for white men in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and he knew just how important it was to keep track of his work and to maintain a um, control over the narrative of his art. A few years ago, he worked with the art historian Jasper, jo um, sorry, Roberta Bernstein, who you see there on the right, and he compiled with Roberta the catalog raisonné for his own art. And in doing so, he chose what was in and what was out. And sometimes that was contrary to what we might logically think of as what is in, what is considered a John's and what is not. And John's uh, felt very strongly that no work should be in that dates before 1954. Because in 1954, he went to sleep, he dreamt about a flag, he woke up, he painted the flag, and then and thereafter, he was Jasper Johns. So if you are a collector who has a work that predates that, you're out of luck because it is not in the catalog raisonné. And Johns, who knows full well the benefit of controlling his own narrative, um, wanted to be very involved in the catalog raisonné and to establish himself in the pantheon like the great Claude Monet and having a tome to honor his own legacy. Now, this was not the case with the very well-known artist, an African-American artist, Romare Bearden, who died in 1988. Bearden was a celebrated artist during his lifetime, um, but he was also a social worker and a civil rights activist and did not necessarily surround himself with opportunists of the art market um, and wasn't necessarily thinking about catalog raisonnés or what's going to happen to his work or how it's going to be received after he dies. He gave a lot of his work away. Um, he gave it to friends. He collaborated with other artists. And so at his, the time of his death in the 1980s, there was no accounting for his art. He did leave behind um, an archive of press clippings and some photographs that he and his studio assistants were able to take of his artwork. But by and large, there is not a compendium of his art. And that's what we're doing at WPI. We're putting together a catalog raisonné of um, Romare Bearden's art. Now, let's bring it back to the art fair. Why we're having this conversation at an art fair is that it is important for collectors, dealers, and art market par participants in general to know what the stakes are and to know that they are actually a part of preserving and building an artist's legacy. Right now, in the art market for Bearden, there is a wealth, unfortunately, of fakes and forgeries. And this is because there is no one source to go to to make sure that the work that you're seeing is actually a work by Bearden. So we are dependent upon collectors and dealers today to participate in this endeavor, which is why we're gonna be talking about this today at the Cape Town Art Fair. So now I have the privilege of introducing my speakers. I have, I've abbreviated their bios, which were lengthy and impressive, and I'm gonna start um, on my far left, your right. Um, Heidi Ehrman is an award-winning independent curator um, and published art historian who has focused on African photography at the South African National Gallery and in 2004 founded an interdisciplin interdisciplinary space, Erdman Contemporary. She launched Legacy in 2021 in the midst of COVID. That was very ambitious. Her most recent project, Being and Present, is a direct response to prevalent categorization of and disconnection from current discourse surrounding recently deceased artists. Next, we have Philippa Duncan. Philippa established Vault Research as a platform to present, pre to present professional and academic projects, including collaborative, 
collaborative ventures. Archives are primary to her research as, a leg and as is legacy management of 20th century archives. Specifically, she managed and developed the Eric and Claude Foundation for the archives of Eric Loebscher and Claude Beaucherain. Next to Philippa, we have the artist, Satambule Mesezan. She is an interdisciplinary artist who works, whose work includes photography, painting, live works, embodiments, films, sculpture, and installation. In her work, she explores issues around spirituality, commemoration, and African knowledge systems. And part of her work examined processes of myth-making used to construct history and calling attention to the absences of the black female body in narratives and physical spaces of commemoration. Her works are exhibited throughout South Africa and internationally, including at Sites Mocha, the Iziku South African National Gallery, the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada, the Oscar Niemeyer Museum in Brazil, and most recently, she received honorable mention at the Norval Sovereign African Art Prize. Congratulations. And last but not least, we have, uh, to my left, Sam Klingetua, who is part of a pioneering generation of late 20th century South African artists whose work reflects the socio-political history of everyday life of their country. Throughout paintings, collages, and prints, he has depicted the evolution of Johannesburg through street life, interiors, jazz musicians, and fashion. His works are included in museum collections around the world, including at the MFA Houston, the World Bank in Washington, DC, Botswana Art Museum, the Johannesburg Art Gallery, and the Nelson Mandela Foundation, and the Durban Art Gallery. His group and solo exhibitions are too numerous to list, but he does, for all of you who are interested, have work on exhibition here at the Art Fair at the Goodman Gallery booth. So now, without further ado, I'm gonna ask my kickoff question and, and turn it over to my panelists. And my question is, what is the state of artists' archives and archival preservation today in South Africa. And Heidi, why don't you begin? Um. Hi. Um, Elizabeth, I think it's limited. It's limited. Um, there are limited resources, and there is also um, limited due to lack of funding. Um, when I was thinking about your question, I was, um, I was mostly thinking about photography. Um, because I do have a background in photography, and um, um, I think I can count the number of um, archives um, or institutions that is um, digitizing historical collections. I can count it on my one hand. Um, I think it is a crisis in our country. Um, there is very, there's very little funding from the state, and it's mostly um, private. Um, I come from a background where um, I came out of the darkroom into the light. So um, my career started just at that transition when photographers were leaving the darkroom and going into um, using um, digital photography. Um, on the one hand, those are incredible collections. They're very, very important collections, those photographic collections. But today, they are very, difficult, uh, very expensive to digitize. And I think um, that, is the one, that is the one major obstacle that we have in preserving a very important and um, um, important part of our history are these um, film archives um, shot on film by very important photographers. So yeah, it's limit, it's, in my opinion, in terms of photography, it's very limited. Thank you. I mean, I would start off also by saying, you know, there, there are artists who leave provisions, for example, in their wills for preservation to take place, for projects to take place, for continuation, of, you know, in terms of the conversation around their, their legacy and their history. But the reality is also is that, and I mean, I had this literally out of the, out of the mouth of a contemporary artist recently, where they, you know, where they said, look, they're, they're making these provisions, but ultimately you know, they're handing their estate over to, the, to their children, and if their kids decide, well, actually, like, who cares about dad's work now? 
you know, they, they can actually abandon it. And I think, I think that's also, you know, when it comes to, you know, individual um, archives, that's often the case. It's not even just the funding, it's the, it's the lack of interest. And I think, you know, a trend that I've noticed internationally is, you know, a lot of the time it's the next generation that actually picks it up because I think they start asking more questions about what is, you know, the person who's now their grandparent or, you know, the artist that, you know, was you know, died 50 years ago, but suddenly they, you know, they, because of trends or because of int their own interests or whatever, those, you know, those questions start getting, you know, start becoming relevant again. Um, and, you know, I think unfortunately the, one of the biggest crises in this country is aside from the funding and everything else, it's even if and when these, these collections get digitized, there's still a lack of access because there's often an expectation for a fee to be paid to be able to, you know, acquire any scans or, any, or, or something like that from, from a collection, and then everything is by appointment, and unfortunately if those collections then also happen to be in a government institution, you might even have your appointment, but when you arrive on the day, the person you made the appointment with just isn't there. So, you know, it, it's like the ball gets dropped a few times over. Okay, so I'm gonna speak to um, a few institutions, or oh, let's see, um, that I've been involved with as well as um, have been interested in. So the AVA began as an association of artists in 1950, and it has one of South Africa's um, largest South African um, art historical um, archives, but uh, only until recently has the artworks and the histories of the artists and the exhibitions that have happened at the AVA been digitized in the past year. So it's now available on the website. Um, and so I would encourage you to look into that. And so in 2019, um, AVA hosted our first exhibition, large exhibition, as Ikriya. Now, Ikriya was a network of 11 black women who were practicing at the time from the University of um, Cape Town at the Michaela School of Fine Art. And um, because AVA is an NPO and there was very limited funding for the exhibition in general, we didn't have funds for creating a catalog. So we thought that it was important to somehow document our existence in some sort of way. And so we decided that we were gonna have a panel which um, Dr. Namusa Makubu was also a part of at the time as a facilitator. And I'm just gonna play a small snippet. Many years down the line, I love myself today. Mainly because I had to make sure that I represent myself today. The only reason why I take self-portraits is because to enhance representation, there's a huge gap. And for a young child growing up in the 21st century and not having that representation, it's frustrating. It's annoying. Why are we still living in the 21st century and not being represented as black women in that bracket, diverse black women? So there's a gap. That was Tony Goom um, just speaking about some of the challenges that she underwent as a young artist, um, practicing as a young black female artist. And so this is important what she said because in the year 2002, Novel Foundation hosted an exhibition called When Rain Clouds Gather, Many which was an exhibition that hosted the practice of over 40 black women from the year 1940 to the year 2002. And these women are the women that paved the way for Ikea to exist today, for us to be artists that are aware of our positionality in the world and who are able to speak to many layers, a plethora of layers um, within our practices that are outside of just race. But I'm also kind of interested why two years after the exhibition, Novel hasn't produced a catalog, which I think would have been quite poignant given that this is one of the biggest exhibitions, if not the biggest exhibition in the Southern um, Hemisphere, in Southern Africa to exist, to host so many black women and their contribution to our art history. 
But they did have a symposium which um, in some sort of way spoke to some of these issues and had a whole lot of academics, artists, and writers participating in the symposium. So now drawing to myself as an artist and my personal experience, in the year 2002, I was part of an exhibition called Two Together. And in this exhibition, um, some of my works were highlighted. And I was pleasantly surprised to encounter the statement that you see over here. So I'll just read the last bit at the bottom. The portrait titled Ovezi directly references this group of enslaved people who lived by the Tugela River that flows from the Drakensberg Mountains to the Indian Ocean. Nguntumbese, uvezi, komo kai pusupsiga neshobo, mfomo betelele ntabini angajliwe silwani. Those are my praise names. Nowhere in those praise names has there been a mention of my people being enslaved. And yet, in the exhibition statement on the museum wall, I had to read this, along with my family who had visited. So that's my uncle pointing to our surname. Not our surname, but one of our praise names. This was deeply disappointing, considering that art historians, academics, curators, students and people around the world come into these institutions, coming to learn about artists' practices, but also what informs what is happening within the geopolitics and spiritual practices of whatever exhibition is happening in that place and area. And so to encounter, encounter such falsifications and inventions is very disturbing because then this will go down in history for the sake of posterity as a lie. Hello. Okay, my name is Sam Tlengetwa. <clears throat> I think in my practice as a collagist, I've seen some collage works around museums, but there's no denying that an image of a collage, it loses its original color over the years. So one had to do his own research, and um, Kay Hassan, who's here, is my peer. We were introduced around 85 with a gel. It's a golden product from America. But doing some experiments about that, I realized that because gel is thick, you make it a bit liquid. And then after doing whatever collage or image you're doing, it becomes a sealer. And I've realized that it also protects the artwork from dust or from losing its color. But I kept on doing more researches. I found out about a, a fixative which says it prote protects the artwork from UV. So whenever I took uh, uh, images of what I'm preparing to do, be it jazz, be it what, when I take it to be digitally reproduced, it's good quality, but I make sure that I enhance that by spraying with that uh, uh, UV protected uh, kind of uh, spray, and again, apply gel. <coughs> and I've seen some of the collages that I've done. They, they do look good, but the unfortunate part is about the collectors. People who collect our works, they're very careless about where they hang their works. I've done, I think, a couple of months, I've done about three restorations. Mm. 
people hanging artworks that attracts the direct sunlight. People putting their works in storage without checking whether there's an object that is disturbing the canvas. So I think it is so important to some of us to make sure that what we produce at the end of the day, whoever buys gets good quality. I'm impressed with NS Cole's House of Bondage. We're talking about images of the 60s before the modern technology was here. The quality of those photographs of NS Cole, they are such good quality. So my point is it takes an individual to enhance and do your own research to make sure that your work is well preserved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Um, I, I just want to speak to something that you've just said, Sam, about the preservation of, of your work and the responsibilities that collectors have to preserve it. Um, this leads me to wonder, do you, are you leaving instructions? Do you make sure that collectors know this? How are these things going, are being communicated? Are they being communicated by the gallery? Um, what, obviously, you want your work to stand the test of time and not to degrade, um, but I'm wondering where, at what point are you not able to, to oversee it anymore? Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Well, well the thing is um, we, we respect the people who admire and collect our artworks. So it's between me and the painting that I feel that I'm happy that somebody can have this mm -hmm. in his or her collection. So the guilt is with me and I can't cheat. But the minute I'm happy, because I always say sometimes to people, I just become like a coin. Coin has got both sides. So I'm like a coin in a sense that I'm producing the artwork and then I flip the coin, I'm no longer the artist, the creator. I'm somebody who's admiring, thinking, can I buy this? If both sides of the coin make me happy, and I'm happy to let the artwork go. Okay, thank you. That's my honesty, because like no one knows that I'm cheating or not cheating. Right, So right. that's my honesty. Uh, Satambule, tell me, tell me from your perspective, at what point are you hands off from your artwork? I think, hello? Um, so a lot of my work starts off in the dream space and it is finished in the dream space. Mm -hmm. And me making it a physical um, manifestation of what I have dreamt is then almost the end of the process, but mm -hmm. sometimes the whole process has started and began in my in my spirit already. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I see the artwork fully formed and it feels like it connects to the vision I had seen, then I'm hands off after that. But depending on which works that there are, especially the works where there's um, themes around mis uh, representations, I have to put in a little bit more effort into thinking about how is that work represented, especially the works around black women's histories. Sure. Because as we have seen, our histories are misrepresented and falsified, right. and that is very damaging for a black archive and an African archive. Absolutely. Um, now I'm wondering, the archivists and curators on the panel, um, to what extent have you experienced in your own work that your, the artist that you're looking at is no longer with us, and the art becomes misinterpreted? or told in a way that wouldn't benefit the artist's own personal sense of self? How long do I have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I became critically aware of this when I was um, doing research for my masters. 
and you know getting stuck into and really properly stuck into the, the archive for Uma Stern. And you know that there is there is so much there about her work and you know Mona Berman shared the letters, you know, the correspondence between um, Irma and her parents, the Feldmans. And when you start looking at those archives and you start then applying it to the way in which Irma has been misrepresented and in many ways, I mean, you know, people will say, well, what do you mean Irma's misrepresented? I mean, she's the most famous 20th century artist that South Africa ever produced. Yeah, but that's quantified by you know, large auction prices and collectors, you know, saying, I own an Irma, you know, kind of patting themselves on, on, the, on their back. But if you then actually start looking at how, uh, you know, the stories about Irma and the dialogue about Irma is actually presented, you, you realize exactly how poorly she's formed within that. And an example I can give is, you know, there are many stories about Irma, the ones that kind of always... Um, you know, do the rounds and somebody will, you know, kind of like pop it out during a, you know, dinner thing. Oh, well, haven't you heard about the time that she was on the bus? Or like, what about that time that kid asked her a question at an exhibition? So, I mean, imagine, imagine this, you, you are an artist, you're standing in your exhibition space. Um, as with many exhibitions, a tour group of, of kids come. Um, not quite sure what the ages were, but you know, they were there with their, with their teacher. And one of the children asked the question, so, Miss Stern, how long did it take you to paint that work? Now, the previous translation of Irma's response was, she snapped back at the child and said, 20 years. But imagine you're that artist, and you're being asked that question by, you know, some kid, and you kind of go, actually, if I think about it, it's taken me 20 years to get to that point that I'm able to produce a drawing that is literally described and articulated in five or six lines. But the intimation of that child's question is, but come on, I mean, seriously, that like took five minutes. So, you know, why, why are we going to take a five-minute drawing seriously? And that's the problem. And again, bringing it back to, to Stone and her legacy, there are far many far too many misinterpretations, not only of her as a, as a personality, mm -hmm. but also the um, incorrect uh, titles that are given to her work. There is a work that is more famously known as um, Woman Sewing the Cross, having actually traced that work back through numerous um, exhibitions and catalog lists and numbers on the frame, etc. The sitter's name was Georgina. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to know that she was Georgina. Or there's a you know, portrait in the Irma Stone Museum that forever and ever has been known as Coloured Man. Well, Coloured Man was actually in a 1929 exhibition described as the best work on her, on, her, on her exhibition. But his name was Albertus at the time. So curators coming with their own agenda and They're their, own with their own interpretation. They're coming their own agenda and interpretation. And... I mean, I've said this on, on other panels. I mean, I'm happy to take down a few <laughs> academic altars if we need to in order to actually get these conversations presented properly. And if that means that, you know, I'm referred to as even more difficult than I currently am, so be it, I can own that. Thank you. Um, I'm an independent curator and I work with um, estates um, but that's the that's for me it's the end <laughs> the, the end of the line um, and sitting Billy and Sam is not going to like what I'm going to say but um, I think the greatest gift that uh, a practicing artist can give us um, a society is a well-organized archive um, and that is kind of um, the legacy that, that I wish that artists would dream of leaving as a well-organized archive because then you are narrating the story and you make those corrections and we work with material that you have signed off on. And that's when these problems happen is that as curators we end up working with 
other people's material and we continue the misinterpretations. And I don't want to quote this um, person in terms of your work. Maybe I find it in your archive and then I do continue to do that. So I think that... Um, I think it's very difficult for practicing artists because um, they are busy with the practice, but the most important thing alongside that practice is it's the most uncoolest word. It's called estate planning. <laughs> it's so uncool because you're so alive and you're so busy and, and then you have to go into your office and say, today I'm doing my estate planning. I know it's so cool and it's like, it's, it's so linked to death in some way. But um, you, don't, you guys don't have to do that work. That's what we do. We do that. I mean, we d I mean that's, what, that's what I do. I help artists with that kind of work. Um, I'm not a practicing artist, but I can certainly do the admin part of estate planning. And I encourage everyone who's a practicing artist to sort of really take that seriously and to be in charge of your own story, to narrate your own story so that we can, we can represent you the way you want to be represented. And that's why I think these talks are very important. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. So, back to, back to the artists. Um, Sam and Satambile, I, I will ask you, are there particular caches of information that you're saving to make it clear what it is you want to represent? Are you emphasizing that? How are you working towards a legacy within your own practice? I mean, Satsambili, you talked very eloquently about finding this misinterpretation and miscategorization. What have you done, or I'm, I'm assuming um, that you were vocal about that during the exhibition, but have you, have you made any sort of response to these things? To be honest, um, capacity as an artist is a real thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of um, museums and, can you please go back to the slides? A lot of museums and conferences have touched on um, care mm -hmm. within museum practice, within institutions, but, huh, let's see, I can't find it. But I think it's a theoretical thing at this point in time. Mm -hmm. I think it's gonna take a long time for museums and institutions to actually think about the duty of care, not only for the artists, mm -hmm. but also for the artworks. Mm -hmm. um, so I was part of this um, conference in 2002, I think, called um, the Attentive Museum, and it's an annual conference at, at CMAM. And a lot of these <coughs> conversations around care and what would it look like to care for an archive, to care for the artists were spoken about. And for me personally, how I um, take care of my archive is that I use a program called Artwork Archive which I will admit is a newer part of my um, process of documenting my work. Mm -hmm. I have been using it to not only take photographs and catalog everything, but to also know where my artworks are in the world. But it's also really difficult to um, know where in the world the artworks are, especially if you're selling through a gallery, right. because all you'll get, if you're lucky, is a name. Uh, so you won't get necessarily their email address, um, their location, and all of that. But this is how I try to um, archive everything um, within my, my practice as an artist. That's wonderful. So would you welcome collectors to get in touch with you who have your work? Of course. Um, so it's also used by collectors, by the way, as well as gallerists. So it's a very good program for all of the above. But also how I make sure that my works are archived and where um, people such as collectors as well as galleries get in touch is mostly on Instagram. Right. It's become a very useful tool in connecting um, the creative world, creative artists with art professionals from all over in the world. But I also um, have um, podcasts that I have done such as the one at um, Radio Web Mapba as well as um, my TED Talk. So my website actually beautifully details some of all of these collections of, of, of activities that I've done and the publications that I have been a part of. Wonderful, thank you. Sam, what's happening with your archive? 
Can you speak to that point? <laughs> I think um, I would say um, I'm one of the spoiled or privileged artists because my wife's profession, she's an archivist. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> So she would nag on me that make sure that your work is well preserved and well looked after. So I think that is one part whereby I feel that um, I'm married to the right person. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I remember during our school days um, in KZ Dendrox Drift. K was with students together. We had a friend who's deceased, Dumisani. If you come to Dumisani's studio and say, Dumisani, are you making an artwork? You say, no, I'm making history of art. Mm. <laughs> and if you think of what he had produced or some of the artists have produced, and it's like now in the history of art. It's not the artwork. So yes, to cut it short, my wife is behind me. Okay, well, so then here's a controversial question. Are there things that you want to discard or throw away that your, your archivist wants you to save? Um, because like John's, I know, and like Picasso, and like a lot of artists whose archives are so integral right now to the art market and the history of art, the artist certainly didn't think everything that he or she produced was a work of art. What's the situation with your production? Well, my situation is based on a stack of uh, sketchbooks that I have. Mm -hmm. So those sketchbooks, the they become like my journey of where do I come from. And some of the artworks, I remember one popular um, 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 radio DJ said, Sam, sell me something that you don't like. I said, there's nothing that I don't like. <laughs> I like everything that I've done. I have suitcases with old works. Because like when you go down memory lane mm -hmm. and look what you have done eight years ago, that could help you to recover yourself or to enhance yourself. So we are stuck with works that are in storage. Oh, by the way, um, as much as I'm a painter, I collect art. We have a lot of collection, but I I sympathize with people who collect art because it's expensive. Yes. It's expensive in a sense that you pay a lot of money for that. And as we speak now, we have three houses that are accommodating our art. So I understand fairly well that art is expensive. But I like and I feel very good to be surrounded by artworks wherever I go. Not everybody has got the same taste, but I easily get bored when I see bare walls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, I don't know. I don't know, I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> so that actually brings up the, um, the issue of preference, and I know that um, certain artists want to tell their audiences their, what they think is important within their art, not only uh, themes, but also particular pieces. Are there, there are works that you have done, um, to both of you, that you want to speak um, or want to represent your legacy in particular, or do you think that all of your work as a collective represents who you are? Because that's something that I think that both Philippa and Heidi can speak to as well. Like, they're choosing what is important, ultimately, in a retelling of who you are. Are there works here and now that you think are essential for people to know? 
Well, with me, I think it's about the audience that dictates that this is this, the, the work that Sam would think is the best. The Steve Biko piece, mm -hmm. which is the collection of vets. But I, I like all my collection. I buy the unknown artists up to K. Hassan, William Kendridge, mm -hmm. and I buy from uh, small galleries. And I always say, use Steve Biko's words when he says, I write what I like and I buy what I like. It has got nothing to do whether it's Sikoto or it's somebody who's unknown. Everything that is under our collection, I think I admire and this is who I am. I agree. <laughs> I think it's very hard as an artist to distinguish which part of your practice is most important mm -hmm. because ultimately they've all kind of con contributed to who you are today. And if you look at particular um, periods within your life uh, as an artist, you will see that there were, there were certain shifts that an audience might not particularly pick up. But if, for instance, you have a retrospective, which I am too young to have one at the moment. <laughs> um, but if I had to have a retrospective, you'd see how different my works are because I'm also an interdisciplinary artist working between photography and what people call performance. And I'm like, nope. At some point, it was performance. But as I shifted in my consciousness of, of who I am and how I represent my own works, I found the language. Mm -hmm. And language has become a very big thing within my practice where in recognizing that English sometimes um, does not articulate the essence of my works in the ways that feel as, as, as poignant and as true to me and as authentically, that I need to now tap into my own language and that is spirit speaking. And so you will notice that earlier practice felt very political, right? But then there was a shift, a spiritual shift that happened and when the spiritual shift that happened, I stopped calling particular works performance because I could no longer see them in that way. Mm -hmm. They became embodiments. They became live works, if not embodiments. Mm -hmm. And then moving from that, I started doing installations and then started doing now paintings. And the paintings were happening for about five years before they actually got exhibited in the public. So the public did not know that I was painting for five years. Mm -hmm. And that shift happened because of loss in my life, multiple losses. And so it is really important to look at an artist's practice holistically yes. in order to yes. kind of hear the different voices that are not just happening personally, but within um, a social context as well. Because as much as we spend so much time in solitude within our studios, we're a part of a collective, we're a part of a collective memory, we're a part of our own society, and we contribute to it as well. Oh, thank you for raising that point. I think that's really super important. Um, we're doing, uh, embarking for the Romare Beer, Bearden Project on an oral history with um, not only his family members and his collectors and his dealers, but people in his social circle. And oral histories are something that oftentimes aren't considered part of an archive, but they're so essential to an archive. And it leads me to think about the gaps in an archive. And um, Heidi and Philippa, when you're looking at archives and you're noticing these gaps, like who isn't speaking here? Who should I go out and speak to? Are you finding that there is a willingness to collaborate and to, to add to that kind of construction of the narrative by other stakeholders, not only family members and associates, but collectors today. Could you talk a little about that? So something I've been involved in more recently was um, establishing a, an oral archive for, for Irma Stern. So actually ask, you know, reaching out to, to the public, to people who I knew knew her directly, um, you know, people who still had fresh stories from their own parents, um, you know, getting, get, asking them to, to go, you know, to actually go on record. And part of what sparked that was I'd, came, I'd come across a letter in, in the Stone Archive where her sister-in-law, Mary, had written to the, um, the trustees and, and UCT saying, look, so, you know, and it was dated 1970, and... Um, 
So, you know, we've heard about the fact that there's apparently a biography in, in, you know, in the works. Um, a, we find it really strange that you haven't reached out to, you know, to us. I mean, we're her, you know, we are her closest living, living relatives and we're very close to her and obviously knew her very well. And then secondly, um, you know, not sure, not sure who you're looking at approaching to, to be doing this, but, you know, Dr. Thelma Gucci was a close personal friend of hers and obviously is also an incredibly well-known um, academic, you know, and she would be the person who is best placed to actually take on this project. I don't believe they ever got a response. Mm. Um, there was also a note included with this letter addressed to uh, Dr. J.P. van der Skols, who had also worked very closely on on the you know the initial sort of fa founding of the of the you know the, the trust and the collection, and it basically said you know this is just a copy for your records. I've you know I have sent one to to the trust and and UCT, mm -hmm. and I mean that publication never came to be. I mean the first re re you know the first sort of biography really on her. It was a very slim publication. Um, published around about 1977, written by Neville Dubow. And of course, then you have the Marian Arnold done, I think, 1995, 96, to kind of celebrate her centenary. Um, and again, there are just, you know, there are no voices within that really from people who knew her. Mm -hmm. um, Dubow knew her in terms of the fact that he was an art critic, he published various articles for, for newspapers, but ultimately, you know, he is in many ways acquired the position as director based on his having known her. Right. He'd had a couple of incidental dinners around her dinner table. He didn't actually know her. Right. So is that, is that the responsibility, then, Heidi, of the artist's estate to identify all these people, to bring that conversation together? Um, Elizabeth, I can't answer that question because <laughs> I, don't, I don't work, um, I don't administer estates mm -hmm. as such. Um, but the gap that I recognized was, um, was a legal one. So when I, ch when I decided to do a gear shift, uh, gear shift in my career, I retrained in law, and I'm, I'm looking to understand the, 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 um, the legal concerns with regard to estate law and estates. Um, and... Um, there is an image, I'm sure you know, we all know this image, it's, very it's an iconic South African image taken by Sam Nzema on 6 June 1976. And um, when I sat there and, and battled with these law <laughs> lectures, I, I decided I'm doing it for Sam, who had to wait 22 years before he could get copyright mm -hmm. um, on that yeah. um, very, very important South African photograph. So um, the, the kind of work I do is um, uh, the, the gap in which I'm sort of grooving is a different, is a different gap. Um, I'm not looking to fill um, the, the um, estates. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Can I just, if you touch something that uh, okay, relates to society before I, I, I go there, I just want to highlight something. Uh, I was introduced uh, to Romer Pierin's work around 76, 77 by Bill Ainsley after he saw me doing some of the collages. And then he said to me, keep on doing more collages because I want to show you something. And after I after did about 15 collages, he showed me a big book of Romer Pierin. I was just like a kid in a candy store because it really inspired me. I was just like thinking that probably um, experimenting, da, 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 da. But I have, I have a lot of respect for Romer Bearden. I was fortunate. I saw his retrospective uh, in Harlem 1991. And uh, Romer Bearden and NS Cole, they, they became my hero. I did a big piece using some of their images, and uh, it was a homage to Romer Bearden and NS Cole. Going back to society, some years ago, I did a show about the people who are recycling material in the city, 
pulling trolleys, etc. And I said, I just want to spend time and look into these people. They wake up very early. And then around four or five, I would be like in the streets of Johannesburg, try to sort of like track them down, talk to them, and they, they knock off very late. And I did the show, The Good Man Gallery. And I remember on the particular day of the walkabout, one woman raised her hand. She said to me, Sam, thank you so much for making awareness to the society about these people, people because we always think they're such a nuisance on the roads. Because like when they push those roads, they, they don't beg you to, to shift. They come straight to your car. So I, I, I felt good that now, because my daughter, she always says, when we drive, they are Papa's people. Because like she knows that I really have respect for them. My last year show, it was more about, because we don't always just want to paint and make beautiful jazz pieces, etc. There should be a message behind in what we are doing. So my, other, my last year show, which ended January this year, it was, the theme was art meets fashion. But I made it clear that I want to work with young boys and girls who are, I don't know how to call it, albinos, suffer from albinism, but it was like that. And I managed to get a, a woman, Palisa, who put that together for me, and I specifically said, I want four boys and eight girls, because we need to put women on the platform. We come from a background whereby our mothers, grandmothers, didn't know anything about art. It was like males. And as we are seated here, I know that somebody is turning in his grave because he said it's a man's world. <laughs> <laughs> James Brown. But yeah, I, I always like to, to make awareness to the society about what I produce. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm conscious of time and I think we can open it up to questions from the audience if there are any. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this talk. Um, my question is for our two esteemed artists on the panel. Beyond preserving a physical archive of your works, what are the other ways in which you would like to build and preserve your legacy as artists? Stop cheating. <laughs> Um, I would really love to have a school for um, young women who would like to experiment and experience what it would be like to express themselves, see the world around, um, see the world through art. Um, I grew up without an art background, but I knew I was always creative, and it actually took my aunt recognizing in me that I should become an artist because I didn't know, I didn't know what I wanted to become. And she found the application um, forms and she helped me fill it out. And because my school didn't have art at the time, I went to Funda Center. So I grew up in Soweto, I went to Funda Center and Funda Center was one of like the key art schools, um, I think around the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. It might have begun around the 18th, might have been early, I'm not quite sure. But it was an art school um, that still existed when I was in high school. Um, I know after I left, there was a little bit of precarity around it because of funding. But essentially, they helped me put together my um, portfolio in order to be able to apply to um, UCT. And I didn't have necessarily other um, support structures and I didn't know any artists. Um, I don't know any black female artists, so I think it would be so amazing, especially for young black women to kind of have an environment where they, this could be fostered. Um, and if there's an investor I'm manifesting in this room, <laughs> 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 
who would like to help this vision come together, um, please get in contact. Thank you. That's why I said start. I, yeah. I knew you'll start very well. <laughs> so uh, just to take this further, um, we used to belong to studios that we co-founded with uh, K. Pet Maldra, the late David Golwani, Big Factory Studios. It's still there. It has produced quite a number of good artists. So, in it's 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 actually I, I realize that some of the young artists get so intimidated to be among senior artists, and then I started something that is to sponsor a young black female for a year, just to gain confidence working with uh, professional artists. So I've been sponsoring that for the past five years, and it takes a year for that artist to be there, and then the committee will select the other year. So I think it's one of the legacies that I'm going to leave behind. Any other questions? Do we have time for one more question? One more, yes. Sorry. I'm a little collector, and I've come across, you know, obviously Sam and the what's her name? Sorry. Stembi. Stembi. I'm sure you know what you're doing. And blah, blah. The problem is most of the artists, their families are not involved. They don't know what's going on. They don't understand the value, and then and then the artist dies. You know, and that's a big tragedy. I think education is to play a part, and I think artists need to involve their families. But then, all of a sudden, you know, people come up with money, you know, and <laughs> you know, they entice the family members with the money, and the family members, because they're inept, they don't know what's going on, they ask for little, or they exaggerate. A piece that's like 50,000, they say, I want 10 million rand. You know, so I think it's important to take the family along. I can perhaps talk to this a little bit. So um, I was brought on as an advisor to the estate of, uh, well, so Eric Lauscher in 2009, same year he was having his big retrospective at uh, Smack Gallery and same year that the, the major publication was, was produced on him. Um, he established the Eric Lauscher Heritage Trust so obviously within that, there's a problem in the fact that it's not the Eric Lapsha and Claude Boucherain Heritage Trust, um, but nevertheless, it's part of the reason I, you know, when we kind of finally finished renovating the, the physical space to house the archive, that I, you know, in my head, I'd already nicknamed it Eric and Claude, the foundation, because in my view, it's setting the foundation for the future for, for them. And the way that Eric structured his trust was to have a to have an accountant, so someone who's responsible for the finances, um, a family representative on the trust, and then an arts person. So originally it was Hans Franzen, um, very well-known uh, academic and writer, a good friend of, of both Eric and Claude's, and he was the advisor. Sadly, Hans passed away, I think, about 2016. Um, and then I officially joined the, the trust in 2019. And Part of my role is to make sure that despite the fact that there is a family member on the trust, that all three of Eric and Claude's children are involved in projects or are told of what's happening or, you know, and to ask them to, you know, to, to share information that they, that they come across or, you know, someone contacts them to share that. But within that, you also have three kids, and I say kids because they're all at least a decade and a half older than me. But, you know, three kids who sort of bring in their own, um, you know, their own kind of familial complications within, within that. And I think that in some, in some respects, you know, sort of stops that, go, you know, stops that process running smoothly. And I mean, I 100% agree that artists need to bring family into it and to make them part of it. But um, I think there also has to be other, you know, other structures in place such as someone like Wendy who can, you know, uh, 
sorry, classic sort of me moment, totally forgets the person's name. Um, such as Heidi, who, you know, will, will develop a legacy project around it. Um, you know, and in the case of, of Eric and Claude, you know, we have a, I mean, it sounds slightly sort of, you know, maybe juvenile, but, I, you know, thinking of ways to engage people when they do come to the space. So we now have a scratch card, which is printed on very high quality paper. It's got an image of one of Claude's paintings on it. There will obviously also be one of Eric's in the future. But the idea is that somebody who comes to the foundation makes a, don you know, hopefully is happy to make a donation. Um, and that money then goes to digitizing and to making the space more accessible. And certainly, you know, putting together a, a comprehensive image base of, you know, not just their work, but letters, correspondence, exhibition catalogs, you know, make that accessible. And then also my dream is to also then fully bring into that the conversation of the Sestichers, because it wasn't just Eric and Claude. I mean, their own home was this hotbed of, you know, cultural life, um, you know, for, for really for kind of 40 years. And that conversation needs to be acknowledged and needs to be part of their ongoing history. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, well, one, one moment. I thought I'll just quickly answer your question as well. And um, so I, I have developed, because you were saying um, to make the family part of it, and so I have developed a legacy project for three children after their mother um, killed their father. So um, it's not always possible to bring the family on board if they are the ones committing the crimes. Thanks. Well, I just want to say a quick, quick, quick one. Um, the gentleman who, who just spoke, um, he's a friend of mine, Spiwe Khalo. He, wa he was so modest. He's not a little collector. He's a serious collector. <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.